the big thing with him, though, is that even in his press conference, he said if he can get down to 355 from where he is right now, probably around 366, he says he's going to be a Hall of Fame player. However, (laughs) that's probably a lot easier said than done. And, you know, playing at 38 or 380 pounds, you know, the, the big thing this week has been that he only averages 35 snaps a game in college. Two down player. Can't, can't can stay you, on the field. Can't do what, it. What what makes you so confident that he can be a three down player? Okay, so first of all, back to the 380 thing. Uh, what's most impressive about playing 380 is not that he was ever doing it, but when he was doing it, he was playing like it, we have it on pretty good record. He was actually gaining slowly weight throughout the season last year and was playing like inc- like he probably started the season at like 365, 370 and got up to like 380 by the time they were playing in the playoffs in you know early on New Year's. Um, which like guys, especially the big fellas in the NFL and in college, you don't do that. You got to be built different to be able to gain weight and not lose weight. So he's somebody that, and I think he has a quote from earlier in the draft process saying like, uh, you know, I'm not somebody that can sit around on the couch for a week or I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll eat 30 pounds worth of weight and put it on. Like that's, you know, just the way that you're built. You got to watch what you eat. You got to watch how in, in shape you're staying with your physicality. But as for the snap count thing, there's a number of context uh, important points that you can make uh, that people aren't making because they either are too shallow to recognize them or because they're pushing a narrative. Here's the reality. Yes, just 35.9 snaps per game on average in college, but a couple of extenuating circumstances. First of all, uh, the, the, the Texas Longhorns, and you can talk to anybody that covers Texas and knows anything about Texas football, they run a pretty unique hockey style rotation with their defensive front partially because that's the way that they just want to you know throw fresh bodies and, and partially because they've got enough talented depth on their team they've got enough talented tackles to constantly be throwing in there and trust to be um rotational players and play a lot of snaps there were also the blowouts like i don't know if people noticed this texas was a pretty good football team last year they went to the uh they were one of the top four teams by by way of the committee by the end of the year and played in the in the uh playoff so they won seven games last year by 17 or more points. Starters don't typically play all of those games. In fact, a lot of the time they play like half the game. And if you look at the snap count by game for sweat, you'll notice, hey, in the first half of the season where they were blowing out a lot of teams, he wasn't playing as much. And then it became much more consistently um, in the 35, 40, 45 snaps per game range as they came down the final stretch and were playing some of their more important games. If, if you take the other guys in his range at defensive tackle in this class and just compare the snap counts in 2023, because everybody's making a big deal about, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you take this guy that only played 35-ish snaps per game in the second round? Well, here's some other guys that were taken in the first or second round of this draft and their snap counts last year. Devondre Sweat had 503 in 2023. Braden Fisk went right after him at 444. His teammate Byron Murphy, a first-round pick, 16th overall. 438, 70, almost 70 snaps fewer last year. Uh, 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 Chris Jenkins out of, out of Michigan, who went in the second round, 418 snaps, Michael Hall, 413 snaps out of Ohio state. Uh, wait, yeah. Out of Ohio state. Uh, and then Ruk or uh, who went before him earlier in the second round, 409 snaps, almost a hundred less snaps in 2023. So this idea that, um, he, he, you know, the snap counts, a huge red flag. If it is for him, it has to be for the, these other guys. And the only reason why you are mentioning it with him and not the others is because of his weight. I, that's not fair. I really don't think that it is. And the second thing about being a, a three down player, when I say a guy is a three down capable player from a draft valuation standpoint, it has just as much to do with the skill set that they have um, as it has to do with the, their conditioning and their ability to stay in the game. Do I think he's going to come in and play 90% of the defensive snaps for the Titans? No, I don't because he is still 350, 60, 70, 80 pounds. Uh, that, that's not like physically, that's just the trade off there for that size. I think that's pretty fair to say. Find me the guy in NFL history playing at, you know, three and a half bills that's playing 90% of the playing 60, 70 snaps a game. Uh, and then we can talk. I don't think that guy exists off the top of my head. Number two, hey, Jeffrey Simmons, like last year, I think he played like 67% of the Titan snaps. Like he was not in there even 70% of the time. So, you know, there's that. These guys are going to rotate and, and, tr- and stay fresh in there. But more importantly than all of that, the skill set element of this is when I say a guy can be a three down player, that is, is half his conditioning and half. Does he have the requisite skill set to be in on pass obvious downs as well as run obvious downs? 
And with Tavondre Sweat, the answer is a resounding yes. He is a really, really strong player with a lot of high-end traits as a pass rusher that will lend themselves to him being a nasty three down capable player who you're not taking off on third down because he doesn't have the skills to be out there. And he's just your glorified run stuffer. He's your tier tart. You need to, you need to get some guys in there that are going to get after the quarterback. No, if, if, you know, if you're not worried about the snap count situation with him or with anybody else, you keep him in there on third down because he is going to be one of your best players that is going to dominate the inside of the line, be a force multiplier for Jeffrey Simmons on the front, which we'll talk about more in just a second. And, and, and he's going to get after the quarterback really well as, as as in addition to being a an immovable run stuffer, which he's also going to be fantastic at. So that's why I'm so confident he, despite his snap count in college, is is a three down capable player in the NFL. And that is a is a lazy, poor talking point. Jacob in the comments says, do you have an NFL comp for sweat? And I think Ryan in the comments says has the most likely one that I've seen, which is Vita Vea is one that comes to mind for yeah. sure. Yeah, that that's guy the, like that's the you, upside pick right there. Like you said, that really just, you know, is that run stuffing huge big body guy that that we saw last year with the with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you know? Um, mm-hmm. in that game against the uh, against the Titans where he was just absolutely unstoppable. And I think that's what you can really see from him in this uh, in in this kind of system that they're running now. And I think that you did a good job explaining why for some of the reasons why or debunking why sweat could play uh, three three downs in, in, a, in a series and not just be a two down player. But there is still this big, element of his game that that is the the attitude and, and the off uh the field concerns for him mm-hmm. which i think do make him a bigger gamble uh than than you know some of these other players so would you right. say that it, that it isn't a gamble so i was texting with a friend the morning after the titans made this pick and uh he was just picking my brain on the draft and at one point he asked so do you, you know, we were talking about sweat. He said, you, you don't think that Devontae Sweat was a huge gamble for the Titans. And I had to sit and I thought about it, uh, you know, trying to think of what the fair way to respond to that is, because the answer is not no, like this, there's, this was a safe pick. It's, it wasn't a gamble at all. Uh, you know, ultimately my answer was, and is that I actually think sweat was the biggest gamble the Titans made. And there's really no argument. Like I think of all the seven picks they made, he was the biggest gamble. I would not categorize picking him there as something that you can call a safe pick. It was not, you know, it was not the uh, like picking Johnny Newton there. If he was more their flavor would have been a safer pick, but I, I feel pretty confident that the Titans think they came out of this draft with their preferred tackle and their preferred defense, offensive and defensive tackle with their first two picks. I think that he was their flavor. And as we had mentioned earlier, it was a fantastic fit for them. Um, but just because something is a gamble doesn't make it inherently a bad idea. And uh, you know, I think most folks see this as a far riskier pick than I do and far riskier than the data on sweat dictates that it is like we've lined up so far in terms of the actual on field situation. So just because it was their biggest roll of the dice, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, it doesn't mean that it was a bad pick. I think it was a good bet that they made. That's the fair and balanced way to approach the analysis of this this pick. So while it was a gamble, it wasn't one that was irresponsible. It wasn't a bad one, in my opinion, based on my knowledge of the player. And I don't think the consensus media situation was as in tune with the consensus NFL perception of sweat. I I think he would have if the Titans hadn't got him a 38. I would be pretty surprised if he had fell out of the top 50, despite so many boards like Dan Brugler having him as the, you know, 35th, 38th best player in the draft. And then the DWI, they'd bump him down outside the top 100. I think that was just always an overreaction. Um, Another thing is the Titans, you know, speaking to the gamble element of this, they made it clear that they laid out clear, firm expectations for him. He has, he's likely to have in his contract fines for certain weight goals. Like if he, gets overweight and does not keep himself conditioned and watch what he eats and all of these things, it's going to be costly to him. And so like there's incentive there. They also, as everybody knows, went down after they met with him. They were the first team that met with him for a 30 visit post the DUI. It was like the day after it happened, two days after it happened. So he explained that to them there. And then they set a coalition of guys down to his hometown 
uh, and, and stayed with him and learned about his family and learned about him and his situation and just got to know the guy and set out those clear expectations for, hey, if we draft you, this is what we're looking for. There's also the Jeffrey Simmons element to this, JT. And Simmons is a guy that came into the league with some off the field red flags. I, maybe not concerns, but like there were things on draft night that and I, I've got friends that are huge Mississippi State fans who are outraged the night of the draft because on the ESPN broadcast, as they like to do, you know, if the, the, the meme about like this guy is the sixth overall pick. He won the Heisman Trophy. Uh, and he, let me tell you about all the terrible things he did in high school is the first thing in my mouth. Like that, that was what happened to Jeffrey Simmons. There were, there were things in his past in high school and some, some domestic situations that, that were staining his resume and maybe a big part of the reason why he fell to the Titans. Simmons obviously overcame that and has become an incredible NFL player and an incredible off the field person. Uh, he's, he's, he's an adult. He's a grown up. He's, he's a good guy. I give him the thumbs up. Good guy. I, I know him well enough to know that. Um, I don't know if there's a better situation for him to fall into to Vondre Sweat that is than being mentored by Jeffrey Simmons because he knows exactly the path that Sweat needs to take in order to shake those those concerns coming out of college and be the guy he needs to be in the NFL. Grow up, grow up in the spotlight, grow up with a lot of money, grow up with a, 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 a high expectation for you coming into the league. And Simmons I think he understands the assignment here. I think he knows that at least this offseason, it is up to him to take this guy under his wing to babysit him a little bit, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and then there's other guys on this defensive front, like, you know, Keandre Co Coburn, his former uh, teammate out of Texas. He's going to be on the roster at least through the the summer and, and into the fall to be a good influence for him. So they've got a support system for a guy that needs to do some growing up that I think is going to lend itself to him being impressive and, 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 you know, not, not be, you know, Isaiah Wilson jumping off of balconies in the middle of August. One last thing we mentioned the Outland trophy, which again is the best interior lineman, uh, according to the football writers of America, that association hands out this award to the best interior offensive or defensive lineman in college. And since 2010, here's the list of guys on the defensive side of the ball that have won that award. You got Tavondre Sweat this past year, Jordan Davis, the Eagle uh, out of Georgia in 2021, Quentin Williams out of, uh, I forget where he goes to school, but regardless, 2018 was Quentin Williams, uh, Ed Oliver with the Bills 2017, and Aaron Donald in 2013. I, I don't know, man. It's a pretty good list. It's a pretty strong list. So like, I, I think there's a, there's a decent track record there as well. So that, that's all, those are all my thoughts on the element of a, a gamble with this pick. Is it a gamble? Yes. Am I super concerned about it? Not really. Do I think it was a smart decision? I do. Now, not it, all those things are nice and well, but sure. is there a way that this really does blow up in their face? Let's say that, yeah. you know, he does end up being that two down player who, you know, plays around 370. There are some off the field issue things that end up, you know, causing some some maybe some distractions during the next season where there mm -hmm. there is an outcome where the Titans may be you know three and seven three and eight and, and there is the, an incident or two is, is that a possibility and is that the outcome where you say that this really was a a big miss in the second round yeah it's easy to see how this messes up you know if if he's just a head case and they can't get him to grow up then that's going to be a failure if he is, you know, even if he grows up, but he can't keep his weight down uh, and or he can't keep his conditioning up, which are, you know, intertwined uh, and, and he's not able to play more than 30, 35 snaps a game. And he you know, or he doesn't he doesn't develop as a pass rusher um, and, and become a guy that they want out there on third down. It'd be fine if he's out there on third down, but we'd prefer to have this guy out there for other reasons. Like those are the ways that he fails. And those are the ways that everybody that doesn't like the pick are pointing out. And, and you know, they, they could come to fruition. I'm not saying that they can't. I just, for the reasons we just spent the past half hour discussing, I don't think that they will.